thanks everyone for uh for coming today to this virtual lunch and learn um my name is chris link i am the uh, community farm manager for the southern appalachian highlands conservancy um and we'll be leading this little talk today um <clears throat> Also, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Chris Smith from the Utopian Seed Project. Welcome, Chris. Hey, how's it going? Pretty well, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and hop in, and I'm just going to get started with uh, kind of what we have happening at the community farm, and then I'll quickly, pretty soon here, hand it over uh, to Chris to talk more deeply about all the things that that they are doing with the Utopian Seed Project, both on the community farm and all around the state and the region. Um, so yeah, so for those of you that don't know, uh, I manage our community farm. It's a 140 acre farm just outside of Asheville where we have multiple different projects and programs and access uh, uh, happening. And so we've been out there since 2000 and 15 really full time. Uh, the land was donated to us in 2010. And since then, we have uh, quite a few different offerings happening. So we have a we have a large 26 acre water quality project, stream restoration project. We have a reforestation project of shortleaf pines. We also have a two about a two and a half mile uh, discovery or educational hiking trail that takes uh, visitors through the farm. We have monthly hikes that you can sign up for on our website, Appalachian.org, under events. Um, and we also, one of the biggest projects is our farmer incubator program. So we have um, all types of infrastructure and equipment and uh, all the things you might need for annual and perennial production and livestock production so farmers can come out and uh, start or expand their business, make it a little more resilient and uh, focus on the growing, and then they can be on the community farm for three to five years and then transition off, hopefully onto their own land or onto some, some type of land with some uh, hopefully permanent uh, tenure. So that's a big offering. We also have a, a venue space. We have a value-added kitchen. Um, we're working on a retail edge at the farm right now. Um, and yeah, and then we also partner with amazing uh, organizations and folks um, like Chris, who we have here today. So um, yeah, so we'll have questions uh, late, late, later on. If you have questions, you can pop them up in the chat. I'll keep an eye on that. And um, I think that's enough for now. I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Chris, to talk about what you do. Good job. Thanks, Chris. Um... And yeah, I guess just to start with a big thanks to the Southern Appalachian Highland Conservancy. I mean, land access is a big issue in this region and I think is becoming a, a bigger issue as basically land prices continue to skyrocket and having available farmland for new farmers and, and nonprofits like ourselves is, is really valuable. So being able to expand into this space and, and do the work we do has been really kind of critical for our work and actually Southern Appalachian are a big um a big part of that process uh it's actually our second site we have another site uh where we also have a a lease agreement at Franny's farm which is also in Leicester North Carolina and we've we've been there for about five years and then this is our second season at the community farm um but yeah the the ability to to expand has been been awesome so really grateful to that so for the next, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes, I just want to kind of really give an overview of the Utopian Sea Project and and what we're getting up to and and why we feel it's important. Uh, so we're, we're five years old now and doing a lot of stuff. So this is going to be a little bit of a whistle stop, big overview of some of the stuff we're doing. Um, questions can go in the chat and then Chris will keep an eye on that and ask at the end. And then if any folks are coming out to the farm on Friday, then obviously we'll be able to talk more about it then, or hopefully we can uh, use this as a first meeting point and engage elsewhere. We're out and about in the community and, and definitely excited to speak to folks and, and share more about what we're doing. Uh, if, if we had to boil down the Utopian Sea Project and kind of our mission or what we're trying to do in a nutshell, then it's really 
all about increasing, promoting, educating around, uh, growing, sharing, cooking, eating, consuming more biodiversity in the food and farm system. We were regionally focused. We kind of think about ourselves as a Western North Carolina focused organization. A lot of what we do does have uh, reach and scope into the Southeast. And we also are part of some national partnerships as well, but we always try and bring it back to Western North Carolina. We kind of have a vision of these macro regional food and farming systems and are very focused on, on seed and seed production and adapting seeds to this region to help farmers be successful growing food in this region as we experience uh, all sorts of challenges to growing food. And, and one of those big ones is climate change and the kind of chaotic, unpredictable with weather that goes along with that. So a lot of our work is just rooted in trying to create a stronger, more robust, more resilient food and farming system by promoting and providing more biodiversity to that system. So that's kind of like everything that we're doing. Hopefully some of that will become clearer as I as I shoot through some of the actual specifics of, of what we get up to on a day-to-day -day, um, thing on our farms. Uh, a lot of these pictures are gonna be from Franny's farm just because we've been there for longer, but um, this picture of the sorghum that Lisa and Shelby are looking at in the bottom left of your screen, that's this year's sorghum crop. Um, and we have about 30 different varieties of sorghum, which is a great gluten-free green grain crop. Uh, a lot of diversity in sorghum. And it's also a very, uh, we think of it as a climate resilient crop because it can grow in very low rainfall conditions with very low amounts of inputs. So we, we put very little stuff into our crops in terms of fertilizers and sprays and all that sort of stuff and just let the crops try and survive in the environment that we're growing them. And then we save seeds from them to make them as tough as possible. So let's jump forward. I've got a couple of grounding slides to kind of showcase why this work's important and then we'll get into very specifics. So this is one kind of like a, I, I feel like a fundamental quote from a, a research paper that was written in North Carolina about diversity in food production. And I, I'll read it to you because I think it's very important. Diversity in food production can be considered on three levels. Genetic diversity as reflected in the range of cultivars which can be selected for production. Species diversity captured through production of a wide range of crops on each farm. And then broad ecosystem diversity, diversity between production systems. So this is, this is a paper written all about resilient food systems, pretty recent and focused on North Carolina. And the two things that we're really targeting in on is that that crop diversity. So like what different crops can be grown in this region. And when we look at, at food systems in general, then we're growing a very, 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 very small amount of food crops out of the total amount of food crops available. So, you know, we always just see the same things in the supermarket, not that much variety at farmers markets. Home gardeners tend to be a little bit more experimental, but there's thousands of edible species. And in general, our food consumption relies on, uh, well, you know, a handful to maybe low teens in terms of the total number of species we consume regularly. So crops, crop diversity is huge and fairly low hanging fruit. And then variety diversity is the other component of this where, again, we're just, we're, I, I feel like the food system could be offering us so much more uh, joy and offerings and diversity and just flavor profiles and, and everything. And it generally doesn't, you know, go into your average supermarket. And if you see okra at all, it'll just be one variety of okra. And that's, you know, you rarely see more than two or three varieties of anything. And usually those varieties are the same across the system. Uh, but when we dig into it, there's hundreds, if not thousands of varieties of most common crops that we just don't get access to in the food system. So we do a lot of that work as well. Uh, so yeah, m more diversity in the food system. That's the, what we always come back to. How do we get more diversity in? Because if we have more diversity, then that's kind of like a pillar of resilience. And then the other grounding kind of concept that I wanted to bring to this quickly at the beginning, I kind of started a lot of this work with a personal obsession around okra, ended up writing a book about okra, 
But one of the things I, I love about okra as a crop, but I think we can apply to the food system more widely is grounded in this quote, which is the desirability of cultivating multiple purpose crops cannot be overemphasized for crops that can produce several kinds of useful products make efficient use of land. The pressure imposed by expanding populations and higher standards of living will force us to produce food, feed, forage, fiber, foliage, and fuel on increasingly limited land resources. Now, I think the really mind-blowing thing about this quote is it was written 50 years ago. So this isn't new information. We just have it largely failed to act on the things that we know to be true. And so uh, when we look at the crops that we're trying to introduce into the food system in this region, then we're always looking at how can we maximize the use of those crops and okra as a quick example you can you know obviously eat the pod that everyone knows about but the the flowers given a useful harvest the seeds give a useful harvest they can be used as a gluten-free flower as well or pressed as an oil the leaves are high protein and edible the stem produces an awesome fiber you know a lot of these crops that we focus on a primary yield actually have multiple uses so we're exploring diversity in terms of the culinary uses of these crops as well Okay, so to jump into kind of specifics, then um, this is this is just okra to kind of, you know, ground you in that idea of like, yes, we know about this one green pod, but here's 60 different varieties and obvious diversity within the species just, and this is just the pods. When you look at the plants as well, then you get dwarf plants, tall plants, big leaf plants, different colored stems. There's just it's just awesome to see how much diversity exists and then sad to reflect that most people and most farmers are exposed to only a tiny, tiny subset of that diversity. So how do we get more of this diversity into the food system is something that we kind of contend with on a daily basis. Um, and then um, okra is obviously a, a commonly known Southern crop um, that people know pretty well. Um, Turmeric is, is another good example. These are all different types of turmeric. Again, we think of turmeric and it's a generic yellow powder. That's that's what most people will think of when you say turmeric. They won't think of this luminescent green color or this beautiful purple hued turmeric because it just doesn't, it's not been integrated into our food system. We've not been exposed to it. But all these different types of turmeric grow well here. In fact, some of them grow better than the standard classic yellow turmeric. Uh, and by bringing in species level diversity and varietal diversity, then again, we're building that resilience as well as different culinary applications of these crops. So there's market avenues, there's culinary applications, and then there's just baseline climate resilience by having not monoculture within our food system. Uh, so just, just a couple of pictures to hopefully start opening our eyes. And now what, what I want to leave you with, because uh, again, I don't have a ton of time, is just a few of these focus areas that we kind of go in on. So we're kind of do going to do this whistle stop tour of some of these different uh, crops that we're working with, but a, a broad category that we kind of tag as tropical perennials grown as temperate annuals is, is again, not a new concept. Like if we go back long enough, then the idea of growing sweet potatoes in this region would have been thought to be foolish because sweet potatoes are a tropical perennial, but they've been you know, we've worked out how to grow sweet potatoes in this region as a temperate annual and then store those roots over the winter to then slip them out. Like we sprout them in the spring and then use those sprouts to grow more sweet potatoes. Like we've we've developed a system to treat that tropical perennial as a temperate annual. So then we can say, well, okay, we've done that with we've done that with sweet potatoes, can we do it with all the other hundreds of tropicals that exist out there, but we don't currently grow in our food system here? And it actually turns out that most of, the, I won't say most, a, a lot of these tropicals have the ability to grow in our climate. It gets hot enough for long enough for them to grow. Uh, and it's just a case of working out some like nuances on the agricultural techniques to make it be economical and productive enough for a farmer to do so we have this large focus area of working with these tropical perennials uh, this is uh, one of our board members jamie swafford who's holding this large yam uh, it's it's a purple yam it's purple all the way through it's called ube uh, it's popular in the philippines and uh it's just a 
the color of it is so vibrant um, and it's used in a lot of flowers like uh, you may have come across if you've seen like purple cookies or purple donuts or any purple baked product then it's probably using ube as a flower base um and it, it grow you know, this is all these pictures that you're going to see are from western north carolina so this is a crop that we have grown um successfully um and, and could one day be more of a, a solid component of our food system so Let's show you a couple more. Um, and again, I'm not going to go deep on all these, but uh, if any of them pique your interest, then please, we can we can do follow-up questions or or talk after this session. Uh, this is a chera. Uh, in fact, that first picture of my daughter, this is a picture of a chera. So again, it's this beautiful, big, tall landscaping plant. It's actually related to kind of indica, which is you see as like a kind of a ditch lily round here as a landscaping plant. But this one produces a large edible rhizome that you can use as a flower. You can easily extract starch from it to make like glass noodles and those types of things. So a very easy to grow productive plant in this region. That's a picture of the rhizomes there. Uh, Yakon, this is, this is one of our top contenders. Um, it looks a bit like a potato or a sweet potato here, but it's in the sunflower family. Uh, the British called it ground apple because it's got the texture and sweetness of an apple. So you can eat this raw once it's cured a little bit and you can just bite into it and it's, yeah, it stays crunchy and sweet. You can juice it and make a syrup, much like a molasses. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm on the tail end of a cold. Um, so yeah, Yakan is very productive, super delicious harvest crop. Uh, a lot of potential. Uh, I hope within the next few years, you'll start seeing this as farmers markets and co-ops and that kind of thing. Um, big, big harvest off these guys. You can be harvesting multiple pounds off each plant very easily. Uh, and actually real nice foliage, foliage as well. A lot of these tropicals are, are beautiful looking plants that don't get the same pest pressure as a lot of our common crops. And so stay looking healthy throughout the season. A uh, taro is one that we're working as one of our top crops. If anyone's coming out on Friday, then you'll see we've got a big taro trial planted at the community farm this year. Um, again, like a, a a pretty ancient food crop across the tropics. Um, like I think it's one of the earliest domesticated food crops that we've got evidence of. Uh, lots of culinary applications. It's a storable root that can be eaten in multiple ways uh, and it grows really well here. Um, we get high yields, chefs are enjoying using it in a, a wide way, a wide array of different applications. And it's it's one of those crops where we, we've we grown it and we're like, there, there's no real reason why this isn't already integrated into our food system, apart from no one's really taken the effort to one, teach farmers how to grow it, and two, teach consumers how to consume it. If we can just work on that demand and supply, the crop itself is, is easy to grow. We've not had to do a lot of stuff in order to get it going. Uh, so so taro is one of our, our big tropicals that we're working with at the moment. There's a picture of some of the, the different varieties that we've grown. We've got six varieties growing at the community farm at the moment, but you can see, you know, good, good size yield, um, easy to grow. Uh, this, uh, we're not in a live audience here, so I'm not going to ask for your, your feedback here, or, although you can throw it in the chat if you want to answer quickly. What has leaves like spinach, tender shoots like asparagus, fruits reminiscent of summer squash, and eggplant, nut-like seeds and tubers that can double for potatoes. So if you don't immediately know what that is, then I hope you immediately want to eat it. I mean, it sounds amazing. Um, I'm going to jump forward and burst the bubble and show you what it is. It's chayote. Chayote is in the squash family. Uh, it's called merleton in kind of like Louisiana, New Orleans type of area, but it's a crop of like Mesoamerica, so kind of big in, in Mexico, Central America. It grows on these long vines, so you kind of trellis it. And at this time of year, it's really fruiting heavily. So you get a large quantity of these kind of like pear-shaped fruits. They've got a single seed on the inside. And it can kind of be, when it's young, it can be eaten like a summer squash. And then as it matures, it gets a, a thicker skin on it. And that thick skin allows you to store it through the winter and then use it a bit more like a winter squash. 
Uh, so very productive uh, as a main fruit, but you can also eat the leaves. You can eat this tender shoots like asparagus. The one thing we can't do here is because it's a temperate annual, we're not perennializing it. The roots don't really get big enough to eat like a potato, but in I've seen fields of this in, in Mexico or videos of fields of it in Mexico where they've been digging up these big chunky roots uh, that makes a good starchy tuber. So I really enjoy the charity. A few more pictures of the fruit. And there's the single seed on the inside. So you actually plant the entire fruit to grow a new plant. Okay, so uh, hopefully that just gives you a, a quick breadth of some of the tropicals where, you know, growing cassava, we've got uh, roselle growing, we're working with gingers, uh, there's a bunch of different tropical legumes that we're working on, there's just, a, there's a lot to go at in terms of just growing it and seeing if it works, and if it works a little bit, then can we get that diversity into the food system, um, so it's it's a pretty fun focus area. We get to work with a lot of creative chefs uh, as we work out how to grow those crops. We're gonna swing back around to some of the um, more common crops here. And this is where, back to that initial quote where we're like, can we introduce more crop diversity into the food system for resilience? But can we also introduce more varietal diversity? So we do a lot of variety trials basically where we're looking at all the different options out there. Uh, Crop Trust is a bit pretty big organization interested in biodiversity, and they um, they hang a lot of of weight on diversity. They say ensuring food security, adapting to climate change, reducing environmental degradation, protecting nutritional security, reducing poverty, and ensuring sustainable agriculture are just six reasons why it matters to conserve crop diversity. So that's a you know a pretty huge statement there to to pin on on crop diversity i would say that they say matters to conserve crop diversity and I, I think conservation is important but one thing we really try and do with the utopian sea project is to kind of have conservation by consumption where we're really we're not just preserving and conserving it for the sake of it we're really wanting to get it into the food system we want farmers and gardeners to grow we want consumers and chefs to consume it we really want it to be like actively used in the food system because if it's a it's a if it's an active component in the food system then the need to conserve it falls away because it's naturally being grown and consumed anyway so we, we try and apply that theory as much as possible um instead of having just a big seed bank of seeds that we're just saving we're like well let's have these seeds saved in the communities that are actually growing and using them and that's the you know the better way to do it in our opinion um but nonetheless, crop diversity is super important. So one, we do these variety trials where we're always looking for varieties that really enjoy growing here or have really standout qualities, whether that's like flavor or pest resistance or drought tolerance or all these important things to us. Um, I'm just, I'm sharing this because it's one of my favorite varieties. Um, and Teddy's Red is a Tennessee heirloom. It always ranks highly on our taste tests. And then another variety, this one is Puerto Rican Everblush, which is a variety we've been growing here for five or six years now. And, and actually there was a lot of diversity within this variety when we started growing it and we've been selecting it for these beautiful round pods with this kind of like velvety feel to it and this beautiful blushing. So it's really one of my favorite okras that we work with and it's absolutely delicious. This one almost always comes high on our taste tests and chefs have described it as having a kind of a, a pea-like flavor, a sweet pea-like flavor. It's so kind of tender and delicious so we do these variety trials to kind of identify these varieties that are often you know just not mainstream in any way shape or form like when we stumbled across Puerto Rican evergreen it was in the USDA seed bank they have over a thousand accessions of okra and we were just pulling out varieties and growing them in variety trials just to see what was there and we mainly luck we kind of stumbled across this one that was like early to produce high yielding absolutely delicious absolutely beautiful you know it just checked all the boxes of what made a really good okra um and now we've been able to grow it out and get it to seed companies and it's distributed much more widely and then when we identify these varieties uh we're able to then 
shake up the genetics a little bit because a lot of the time the genetics of varieties that have been around for a long time have become really narrow because they've been inbred so we're like okay this variety has these really good traits but maybe it's not great in a farm system because it's not productive enough or vigorous enough or um some of these kind of agronomic issues that we run into so we can take that Antetti's red and we can take the Puerto Rican Everblush and the two fantastic okras and then we can cross them together and from that crush, you get all these different progeny that just give you so much diversity and beauty to then find new things within that mix. And so this is a picture of the children of an Antetti's red Puerto Rican evergreen cross. And again, you can you can see the diversity in there from that cross. So we're seeing some of the Puerto Rican everblush smooth round pod shape with the Antetti's red coloration, which is really what I'm personally hunting for but we like to distribute these seeds early in this process so that other people can grow these really mixed populations and then pick out the varieties that they like and kind of develop their own kind of relationship with the seed over time and technically their own variety if they continue to select for certain things. So really trying to like make seed engagement work accessible and fun and engaging um, on, on many levels. And I think these kind of real diverse mixes are a way to do that. So it's been a fun project to go down this rabbit hole and we'll, you know, this could be a multi, it will be a multi-year breeding project to see what comes out of the far end of it. Um, we've brought in Warren Wilson as a community partner on this one, because they had enough space to grow out all these different okra plants to express this level of diversity. <laughs> Uh, this just quick picture to show that, you know, we, we do a lot of taste testings. Each plate has a different variety of okra on it. And then we work with chefs to taste different ones. We do public events called trial to table events where we invite, we sell tickets and people come and taste lots of different chef, chef dishes to experience the different types of food that we're trying to introduce. But we always include a tasting component where people are able to come and taste 10 different tomatoes or 10 different yard long beans or last year we did a big squash tasting and give their own feedback so we can get community feedback into this system to to work out like what what do the consumers really enjoy uh, and then you get that community buy-in to go okay well I've helped select the flavors that are going to go forward in this project that hopefully then we'll get to farmers to grow to go to the market to then you know, complete that circle. It's all very circular if we include consumers and farmers in the process. Um, I've shown you a lot of okra pictures just because I'm kind of obsessed with okra, but um, but we work with a lot of a, a wide range of crops. So um, do a lot with southern peas or cow peas. This is a big tasting on the left of all the different varieties of southern peas we've grown. Um, and then on the right, there's this beautiful, really delicious southern pea called the conch pea that we've been uh, working with for about four years now. Uh, it was another variety that we pulled out of the USDA. It was kind of hidden in there. We did the taste test. It came out delicious. We got it boarded onto the Slow Food Arc of Taste and we've distributed it through seed companies. And we've really tried to get that variety back into the marketplace just because it's a real high performing, delicious uh, pea. So um yeah, not, not just okra, even though it's sometimes I come across like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is a field of sweet potatoes, uh, but not just one sweet potato. Obviously, hopefully you getting the picture by now. This is one of my board members, Jana Fishman, uh, curates a collection of about 100 sweet potatoes, and she grows them out each year and kind of monitors them all and then shares them widely to try and get these sweet potatoes uh, redistributed into the communities. So this is a field of probably hundreds of sweet potatoes in front of you. And this year we've taken 10 of her varieties and we're growing them out at our farm to do further kind of like analysis on them to then get out to more farmers to try and bring some of these varieties back to the marketplace. So um, always doing taste testing that I feel like without flavor and and the food side of things then it's just not it's not the same conversation excuse me <laughs> this flu is catching up with me oh that i i forgot i put this one in this is um back to those trial to table events where we do tasting so last year we did a yard long bean tasting with 10 different varieties 
and they're just always they're, they're fun we get good information people enjoy it it's just a i feel like variety tastings are something that should be included in all all crop trials a lot of time the variety trials happen in isolation in the field and don't always make it back to the the consumers and obviously what's the point in growing it if people aren't going to enjoy eating it and then the final kind of variety picture i wanted to leave you with um was th this is 21 different collard varieties uh we're part of a another collaborative project called the heirloom collard project and within that project we're kind of stewarding and regenerating a whole bunch of old-timey varieties that were saved in communities across the southeast and and we've grown them out as standard variety trials to assess each of the different ones and these collards are so so delicious and tender and have their own flavor profiles um but one thing we've done with these collards is is when we've grown them out in a big trial and to be honest this was almost a happy mistake in the beginning we did the variety trial in 2020 and kind of as the season came to a close we were like okay variety trial is over it's getting cold winter that type of thing and we kind of just ignored them going into the winter we didn't kill them off or anything we just left them collards are pretty cold hardy and will often survive a winter over here but people generally might cover them or that type of thing but we just left them in the field and ignored them and sometime over that winter period there had been a a and maybe two weeks or so when the temperatures were in the 70s so a pretty warm winter and then like overnight it plummeted from that 70s temperature to eight fahrenheit so huge temperature swing and plants generally don't like temperature swings and even without the temperature swing eight fahrenheit is pretty cold for a collard to survive and so i was fully expecting that i was like oh that's that's the collards done then and expecting to see a field, field full of mush but when I went to the field a few days after that weather event, de definitely a lot of the collards had gone to mush. They were just like, ooh, no more collards. But right next to the mushy collards, there were collard plants that were alive and green and were like, mm, I didn't notice that cold swing. And they just were totally happy. And we, I saw that within varieties and I saw that between varieties. So across my whole 21 varieties, there were examples of surviving collard plants across all varieties. And we lost about 40% of the collards in that cold swing, but we had a lot of these healthy survivors. And so we decided to let all those collards grow up and anything that survived the winter without any additional care went to flower and intercrossed with each other. So it was a very much an environmental selection for super tough collards. And we already knew that these were beautifully diverse. We already knew that they were delicious. And now we were making an environmental selection for extreme cold tolerance. And we've been saving these seeds and growing them out as a real diverse mixed population for we're going into our fourth year now. And they've just continued to like express themselves in different ways we've maintained beauty and diversity and deliciousness um but every year we just let them go through the winter and see which ones survive and save seeds from those survivors so these are and, and again we don't irrigate we don't really fertilize so these are like super tough but also super delicious collards that i think give us a high level of genetic diversity within the mix and therefore a high level of climate resilience when growing in these erratic weather conditions that we're experiencing more and more and more so this was the beginning of a, a series of experiments we've done which we call the ultra cross where we just have these high diversity mixed populations we've done it with okra now as well so this is a field of 100 different varieties of okra that we allow to intercross we're working on it with squash and sorghum and southern peas and yard lung beans just to kind of like have high genetic diversity within a single mix and then see which ones thrive really well in low input erratic weather type conditions so really doing the selection work for resilience is a big component of what we're trying to achieve so that that was that was the the thought I wanted to leave you on was that kind of like where can we take this diversity in terms of creating the systems that really serve us going forward, um, and I, I'm going to close it out there and and go to questions. But two final slides just in case you want more information on how to follow along. We've I kind of like have like an inner inner Patreon circle which you can sign up to if you want to, um, and we've got some ways for farmers to get involved on our website. 
Uh, but then also following along on social media is a great way just to stay in touch. Uh, we we post pretty regularly about the stuff that's going on and, and usually reply to messages and comments pretty quickly. So I might kick it back to Chris here. And um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to keep chatting. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and grab a couple questions here. Um, you mentioned the ground apples the the um, that are almost like could function as a storage crop. Is that is, is that possible that they would keep for for uh, for a decent amount of time in your experience, or do they or do they not keep that long? Oh no, they they keep really well. Um, we you know so we generally harvest the acorn right around frost. So like towards the end of October, we're harvesting them. They go through a curing process kind of similar to sweet potatoes where they they sweeten up after a couple of weeks of storage mm. and then we we served fresh yakon at our may trout a table so harvested in october still super fall, firm and, and edible the following may and and actually i think they would store longer than that to be honest um we just ended up using them all at that particular event but you know definitely six months without really trying well that seven months without really trying root cellar like conditions so you know cool cool and humid that's exciting um okay and then another question there would be um let's see uh george is asking what elevation and soil type are these far are, are are your farms where you're growing Good, good questions. Um, so we're we're in Leicester, North Carolina, just outside of Asheville. I think you might be able to answer better on the community farm, Chris. But I'm guessing about twenty one hundred feet. Twenty one to twenty two, somewhere in there. Yep. Yeah, and and Franny's is kind of the same. We notice like Franny's is in a hollow, and so tends to like get a frost pocket effect and is next to a creek so it doesn't dry out quite as much and the community farm is on a ridge and so it's kind of the opposite we got a heavier winds there a lot more pest pressure because it's a bit more isolated uh, and dries out much more quickly but i don't feel as if it got the same frost damage as as franny's did uh, on the same time frame but Bo both farms are only a couple of miles apart um in terms of soil type then both, well, actually, Franny's has got a little bit of sand in it, but we're dealing with kind of like mountain clay for the most part, like kind of a clay, clay, sandy loam, maybe. Definitely, yeah. At the, at the, at the community farm, it's 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 high clay content, and we've worked for eight years to kind of add organic matter through different methods, including adding compost. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's re it's really interesting on the community farm this year. We um we expanded the amount of space we were using there and so last winter we we silage topped a, a new section that i think chris you told us was was in production a handful of years ago but hadn't mm -hmm. been used for at least what three or four years three years mm -hmm. um and so it kind of just been in in mode mode grass weedy grass type setup yeah. and we silage topped all that and it was you know it was it was hyper compact and we we didn't till it or do anything to it really we just that one we did harrow the top just slightly to have a seeding bed but on on that end we direct seeded some of our ultra cross squash and um okra populations and considering we didn't amend the soil at all and we didn't irrigate that side of the field at all then the squash germinated quickly, was hyper vigorous, and has produced a ton of squash. Um, deer actually came in and ate the okra, so that one we're still working on. But like, we gave we we treated those squash so badly and got a really good yield from these like diverse mixes. And it, in the first field where we grow, where we treat things, we've actually got irrigation on that field, and um it's had better amendments and has been found for longer. We had a seed crop from a random seed company that were growing squash and we had to baby and look after those squash to really get them to produce. But the real diverse mix, we pretty much ignored and produced fantastically. So it was kind of a good side-by-side -side comparison of how that diversity can really lead to a lot of vigor and resilience in the environment. 
I love that. Um, great. That's a interesting, interesting answers. Um, anonymous. Are there are there a list of farmers growing these crops for purchase? So for all the uh, for all the all the seed work you do, do you want to talk about the cooperative or? Yeah, yeah. That's kind of so. The slowly we're getting there i guess I, agriculture moves pretty slowly seed work is even slower um so the the aim is to get to a point where yes farmers are, are growing and distributing these varieties and crops and and people are able to consume them uh i don't have a list of farmers of who are like i have like farmer examples in different places that i know are growing them this year as we're slowly kind of informally getting these crops out there, but not not on a big scale. We have seed companies selling some of our varieties. So if you're a home gardener or a farmer, you can access those varieties through um, some of these seed companies like So True Seed, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, Experimental Farm Network, and Ujama Seeds are selling our seeds. But one big step we've taken this year that um, Chris has helped out with is we formed a a Western North Carolina. Actually, I think we've officially named ourselves or almost officially named ourselves. We're going to be the um, Appalachian Seed Growers Collective uh, where we're, we're pulling farmers in and trying to, the varieties that we're working with in the field, we're kind of getting those varieties to these farmers within the collective that are then growing those seeds, th those crops out for seed so that we have enough seed available to supply the farmers. So there's kind of like a whole supply chain process that will, doesn't currently exist in any real decent way. And so we're trying to kind of build that up from the ground to create a system where we can support a regional food system with regionally grown seeds. So that's maybe not the most satisfying answer in terms of like, where can I go to buy Yekon? But, um, but that's the process we're working on in terms of like trying to create a real uh, solid system to support the diversity that we're working with. Thanks, Chris. Um, let's see, one more. Uh, is part of the intention with this environmental selection, uh, assume seed selection, crop selection, uh, this work, is it to absorb the potential financial and time risk of losses for, for local farmers? And I guess that means, are you shouldering some of these risks to make maybe so that the varietal selections can just hit the ground running for farmers maybe that's kind of uh, how i'm interpreting yeah. it yeah uh, so yeah I, one of the reasons we set ourselves up as a nonprofit was because we knew we had to have the um the luxury to fail um <laughs> and we also know that farmers work really hard and take on a lot of risk and don't have the luxury to fail in the same way. So asking a farmer, even asking a farmer to, you know, we, we know that saving seed in a region leads to regional adaptation that leads to better results. And that's cool to know that, but saying that to a farmer saying, well, therefore you should save your own seeds is kind of obnoxious and unfair because farmers have already got it pretty hard. So for me to stand up and say, hey, farmer, why the hell aren't you saving your seeds? That farmer should punch me in the face. Um, so that it, oh, knowing so that true. that's a say again. I said so true, right? That's yeah, yeah. That's yeah. What would happen. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so knowing that one, there's a need for this, and and good results can come from this, and knowing also that farmers are super stretched and it's hard work being a farmer, then that's why we we're like, well let's set up a nonprofit to do the work of either as assessing better varieties for the region, regionally adapting seeds so they perform well in this region, doing the low-level breeding work to create varieties that do work well or address specific needs of the region, or creating these hyper-diverse mixes that can create resilience and give crop options in a changing climate, then yeah, we're, we're definitely shouldering that work to support the farmers. We one of our core goals is for farmers to 
one, have crop options in a changing climate and two, be economically viable in a changing climate. Because without those two things, they can't grow food in a changing climate. And if they can't grow food in a changing climate, then we can't have any level of regional food security. So yeah, we're really trying to do the work to support the farmers in doing what they do best, which is growing food. Um, so I don't know if that quite answers the question, but I think the short answer is yes. I think that's great. Um, and then one last one. So what 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 do you do or what do you need to do um, in terms of mitigating pest control? Um, is it IPM or is it let's see, like, let's just see what happens to create a more resilient, you know, let's let's see which which seed, which crop has the most resi natural resilience against pest pest pressure. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um Pests and diseases are, are an obvious challenge. Um, so it, it depends a little bit. Uh, we we gen for our like real diverse breeding populations, like these ultra cross concepts, it's a real like live and let live type of scenario where we don't give them anything. And if they survive, we save seeds from them. So that, that one's almost easiest because we don't, we don't treat them for anything um and if something comes in and totally takes them out then it's like okay they didn't they didn't have what it took to survive back to the drawing board most of the time what we see is that some plants get taken out and some don't and then we're able to select positively for for that environmental pressure there's a great book called um return to resistance which really advocates for this like massive like large populations of diverse genetics where we can do recurrent mass selection on surviving populations and over time develop horizontal resistance really broad horizontal resistance within crop types that have like kind of complete and absolute resistance to whatever parasite you want to select for now that's he's that's recurrent mass selection over a 10 year period so that's like a lot of work to get to that point but the the theory is sound and that's what we're trying to apply for the ultra cross for um for variety trials where we're already working with existing varieties then yeah we kind of comparing 10 varieties and we want to save seeds or, or recommend the varieties that naturally do well so this year we had 32 different tomatoes in the ground we did a blight assessment towards the end of the season and we eliminated half of them so we only ended up with 15 that ranked four or five stars on blight and then we did a taste test on the remaining 15 and ended up with five tomatoes that were happy to take forward next year so we were like you know some tomato is better than no tomato so the blight was the the first thing that we wanted to assess for and then once we got down to a population of 15 we were like well what's the best tasting tomato and then we have our five somewhat resistant to blight plus good tasting tomato. And then from there, we can do regional uh, adaptation and selection to try and improve those qualities. Um, so uh, it, it it does depend somewhat. Uh, the only time we ever really spray things is actually usually when we have a seed contract and an obligation to another seed company where we've said, we'll grow out 10 pounds of beans for you. And, you know, they're totally getting decimated. Or sometimes at seedling stage where, you know, we might put BT on brassica seedlings because it's kind of like the entire thing is an absolute wash if we don't. Um, so that's that's one of the few exceptions. But 95% of the time, we're a no spray operation. Okay, um, that's it for questions. Uh, and the if anyone has any more questions, post them now. Um, a couple things I just want to say. Obviously, thank you so much for your time, Chris, and showing up and sharing all that you're doing. Um, it's enough to do all this, let alone take the time to to share it. Uh, and it sounds like too the amount of the amount of um, the amount of progress that's being made in one year, like you mentioned, uh, these many varieties of sorghum, the many varieties of tomatoes, the selection process that you're able to accomplish in one year is just really exponential in terms of the outcome and information that you glean from that. So 
just to acknowledge the, you know, you, we, we get one season to grow a tomato. So growing many, many varieties, and then not only seeing what's the most resilient, but also what tastes the best is just, it's just really exciting work. And, um, and like that person asked about the farmers, like this is something that a farmer could never really take on uh, if they're growing for market, you know, to, to say, Hey, Hey, farm partner, let's grow 10 varieties of tomatoes and then do it. Yeah. Do it, do, do a trial, let it go. Just let it, let it go and have pest pressure. Isn't something that, that a farmer is really ever going to do. So it really is filling in this, this huge gap is huge. And I want to say when we have, um, hikes on the farm, when we have these Q and A or these, um, the, our different workshops, a question that comes up a lot is climate change and how can we respond? How do we as farmers, how do we as growers in whatever capacity respond to climate change? And often all I really, I mean, I understand, I understand the concept of what Chris is doing at the farm, of course, but, uh, a lot of times I respond with a more, um, how you design or set up your growing area, where it is, or um, microclimate work, di different things to mitigate that climate change or those extremes, but that really only goes so far. So this, what is your selection of seed, Chris, really addresses at the core, like no deeper could we be addressing the climate change, reacting to climate change and how do we address it by the selection of these tough, tough seeds, because that's how I like to grow too, is just put the seeds out there. Don't water a whole lot. See, see what happens. And then whatever is, whatever comes through is going to be the best seed for us to keep using. So there's um, a pretty interesting fundamental shift in thinking between like currently a lot of people modify the environment to suit the seeds. We see that with irrigation, all the pesticides, greenhouses, et cetera but there is a viable option to modify the seeds to suit the environment. And we don't do that when we have a global and national seed supply, but if we start looking at macro regional stuff, um, then we're able to do that work to make the seeds work in the environment we have. And then I think we have a more sustainable system because we less rely on externalized inputs. Makes sense to me. Um, awesome. Well, if anyone else wants to sign up for the, uh, for the tour this Friday, we're, we're, we're going to be at the community farm with Chris. Um, it's going to happen at 12 o'clock, uh, a nice lunchtime um, community farm tour. And we will also tour the whole property uh, as well. Um, you can go to our website under uh, our events, Lunch and Learn Part 2, and sign up there uh, for that hike. Awesome. Yeah, if, there, if, if there's nothing else, I think we can we can go ahead and wrap it up. So thanks again, everyone, for uh, attending today, and we hope to see you on the farm on Friday. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you all. I'll see some of you on Friday.